What's good, fam? Happy Wednesday, everybody. I hope y'all are having a great week. We sure are having a great week because this is the week that our book came out. Christian and I, Christian and I, Two almost corrected me on my English, so I just gotta go ahead and say my grandma's watching me talk and it's making me nervous. We had a book come out and we are so excited about it. It's called How to Put Love First. Go get your copy. It's a 90 day devotional challenge. So you can go through 90 days by yourself or we encourage you to do it in your community. Do it with your boyfriend, your husband, your girlfriend, your mama, your daddy, whoever is in your community that you wanna go through this challenge with. We encourage you to do it. I just believe it's gonna be so strengthening for your life. This is not just for the people who are married or dating. This is for the single. This is for everyone. Because how to put love first is not talking about how to put your man first. It's talking about how to put God first in your life. Because if God is first in your life, then love will flow from there. So we're so excited about it. We hope that you love it. If you take the challenge, if you're reading it with us, please tag us on Instagram. But today I have two very special guests on the podcast. I already mentioned Two Mama is here, which I know y'all are so excited about because you all love Two Mama. But many of you, you have not met two papa. And so I have two mama and two papa, my grandparents, my mom's parents on the podcast. And I am just so excited that y'all have joined me today. So thank you. Good to be here. We're excited. Yes. And I have to say, I did bring two mama along with two papa because you just never know what this man is going to say. <laughs> so so I brought two mama for help just in case you start telling Laffy Taffy jokes. And I don't That's know if right. you can see it, but if she grabs my arm, you'll know why. No, I'll just be like gently. <laughs> <laughs> Stop if the story needs to go to some other direction. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Tumala is the best. I can't wait for y'all to get to know him, but he does say some crazy stuff sometimes. So we got to have Tumama there for help. But okay, how long have y'all been married? 52 two years. 50, it'll two be years. 50, yeah, 52, yeah, in December. 52, December, December 27th. Yeah. That is crazy. That's years. amazing. So they've been yeah. married 52 years. Um, they are just the best grandparents ever. And y'all are pretty much two mama and two papa to everyone who knows y'all. Yeah, Adults and children alike. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of my friends are like, I don't even know their real names. They're I know. <laughs> people, t people tell me that at the conference. Yeah. You know, a couple they weeks ago, they were like, I don't even know your name. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. They're the best. Um, so before we jump into all the things that I want to ask y'all about, just the reason why I wanted two mama and two papa to come on the podcast is two papa gave this speech the other day um, in Western area where we live. And it was at the Chamber of Commerce. Commerce, yes. And they'd asked him to talk about just the things that he's done with business and things he's even done for our city and stuff. And so he was sharing and I was like shocked. Me, Bella, John Luke, Rebecca, we were all there. And we, so many things you were saying, I would look at two mom, I'd be like, what? Y'all did this? You did that? What? And at the end of it, you asked me, did you learn anything from that? And I was like, I think the biggest thing I learned is how humble you are because of how much I just learned because I didn't know so many of those things. And I mean, that this is who y'all are. Like you all do a lot and you make a huge impact, but not everybody has to know. And a lot of people know my other grandparents, which is awesome. Mel Campbell, Phil are amazing, but y'all have done so much. It just might not be on TV that has made so much impact around the world and on our family. And y'all are truly like second parents to us. And so I just am so excited for people to get to know all the stuff that y'all have done and who y'all are. Um, but first, since our book did come out yesterday, I just want to ask y'all the question. After being married 52 years and living life together, how do y'all put love first in your life? How do we put love first in our life? You know, I think when you've been married 52 years, I was 18 when we got married. And if you put God first, you don't know any other way, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, good. it's just a reflection of who you are mm -hmm. if you continue to put God first in your life. Now, in 52 years of marriage, can we say that we didn't ever fight or any of those kinds of things? No, that's ridiculous. Of course we, of course we did. But again, because God was first in our relationship, we were always able to work things out and good. get back get back to the love and mm -hmm. you know and there's things we always did of course to keep god in in the marriage is go to church never missed a sunday morning unless we're out of town and uh took the kids and uh the grandkids and mm -hmm. so uh he was always most important and uh one thing we've always done which uh is uh really makes a difference is just every time there's a prayer public private or whatever first thing that happens is we 
hold hands. Mm, and so doing that for 50 or 53 years, even before we were married, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that draws us together and uh, it gives you a good feeling when that happens. That's so it's sweet. a little connector, you I know, love that. and yes. I think that like sometimes like even on the way to church, everybody knows there may be a fuss or fight, but then you get there and then you reach across for prayer. Then you go, OK, you. we're centered back again where we need to be. Yeah. And, you know. That's awesome. I love that so much. That's so good. That's so sweet. I can like imagine every girl listening to this podcast being like, oh, this <laughs> goal's right there. That's so good. And also, let me say too that we did those intentional things like like you and Christian are already doing, you know, with um, we went to marriage that, retreats and mm -hmm. date went, to, went on dates and traveled out of town, you know, those kind of things. And those years that you're starting right now when the kids are all little, that's when it's really important to continue to do that because yeah. you're going to have so many more years without kids. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to at least like the person. It's so true. <laughs> have a relationship with that person. Yeah. Uh, when that's all setting that, because that's all super fun. You know how much I love that. You know, yeah. I'm the ball game and I'm at all. I want to be at all the things. Yeah. But you, you're you're going to go back it's to good. that first couple yeah. relationship. And here's something to remember, too, is that I read somewhere one time that uh, people change about every 10 years. And so 10 years after you're married, you're going to wake up and say, who's that guy? <laughs> who's she? <laughs> and you've got to fall in love again, all yeah. over again with that new person yeah. wow. that you're with now. That's yeah. good. And grow together sure. and change together. Which that's so good because, you know, you hear all the time, like, people never change. But I've heard y'all say that before, that you, know, you do change. Yeah, people you do, change. do change. And falling in love with who you change to be together and like not letting that make you go apart, but refalling in love and making an, that an intentional thing. And I love that you said that because one thing that I think we talk about in this book, but I'm also already writing my next book and I'm making a big point about this is that, you know, we make this thing with God. It's like, oh, we have to have like our 10 minutes of quiet time or else like we didn't do our time with God. And I'm, I'm just trying to like relieve you of the pressure of that, that God's not mad at you because you didn't spend the 10 minutes with him. In fact, like it's not just about 10 minutes. Your relationship with God should be 24 seven. You know, it, it's an always thing. Just like for me, a Christian, do I love to go on a date with him? Yes. Does that help me fall in love with him? Yes. But that's not all of our relationship. Right. We're going to go back home to the kids and that's just as much a part of our relationship. And we're going to have mundane moments and that's just as much a part of our relationship and all those different things. And so I view like those 10 minutes or the quiet times that we get with God as like a date with God. You get that sweet time, you get that intentional time, but then it's a 24 seven relationship. And that way you're not beating yourself up because you're like, oh, I didn't have that specific 10 minutes. It's like, oh, well, maybe you didn't get to go on a date today, but you're still in relationship. You're still in community communication with him. And so I love that. Yes, being intentional about your relationship, keep dating each other, do the fun things, but also know that like there are going to be seasons of your life that are not going to be as fun or not going to be as exciting, but you still have to be in that love together. But we have to remember that God never changes, even though we do. Yeah. And so he's always the center. Yeah. Always go back to him for your anchor. It's good. To then That's good. mend any relationship relationship issues you're having as two papa tells more of his story like in the business world then um you'll also see as he, he tells because he was super super busy young dad and i was a, a young mom with three little kids and so you know we lived through all the things of yep. the super busy and um am i are we gonna have a chance to go out to eat or we get which sometimes there are weeks without that mm -hmm. you know yeah but you know you still it's good. Still move on. I love that. I know so many people are like leaning into this conversation already now because they're like, okay, I'm young married. I want to be 52 years down the road. Some people here are listening and they're moms and they've been married for 15, 20 years. And they're like, how do we make it the long haul? And so you're in a good place. Listen to a good place. And maybe some of you are single and maybe you're pursuing business. Well, just get ready because two of is a business career. It might shock you because there's so many different pieces to your business career that shocked me because of how much, um, impact you made on these 
big things that so many people know about, um, but maybe people don't know you're the guy that was such a big part of it. But before we get there, because I know you listen to my podcast, Two Papa is my biggest fan. Literally one day on Facebook, it's like my public Facebook page has like a million followers or whatever. It was like, who are your top fans? And no joke, on my top <laughs> fans, out of a million people not knowing this man is my grandpa, it was John Howard. <laughs> it was Funny. John Howard. He has every newspaper article that's ever been written about me. He has every like lanyard of any uh, LO <laughs> thing he's come to of mine. So this man I know listens to the What's Good podcast. So Chupo, well, what is your best piece of advice that you've ever been given? Well, as it relates to marriage, and it's something for all you uh, young marriage to remember, and those seven-year itch marriage that uh, uh, you may be wondering about is that uh, I'm not sure if I read this somewhere or heard it. In my mind, I made it up, but I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> it either way is possible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it occurred to me, or again, I read somewhere, that uh, the golden rule, I know this is mine, the golden rule is not for marriage. The golden rule was written for your relationship with your unrelated people. Or, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you because, because you don't know how they want to be treated. But in the marriage relationship, it's important that you treat, you practice the platinum rule. Do unto others as they want to be treated. Because I know in our early years, I treated Chris as I wanted to be treated. Well, she didn't really like that. She didn't want to be treated that way. And just think of all aspects of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, there are ways that she prefers not to do it that way. And as I learned that, then I realized, realized it was not right for me to continue to treat her as I want to be treated, but I need to start treating her how she wants to be treated. That's good. And so that's a key point. Y'all, sleep is just important. It's important for everyone. I love sleep. I appreciate sleep. I'm trying to train my kids to appreciate the gift of sleep, and that is why I'm here to tell you about Hatch. The Hatch Restore 2 is your bedside sleep guide and your best friend when it comes to getting quality sleep. It's an all-in-one machine that's an amazing combo of sound machine, light, and alarm clock that fits right on your bedside table. Plus, I'm not gonna lie, aesthetics do matter, y'all, and Hatch Restore 2 is super cute. Good rest is one of the things Things that allows us to be the best versions of ourselves, and that's why Hatch Restore 2 is made specifically to help you form healthy sleep habits for your whole life, and that's something that we all need. So your Hatch teaches your body to recognize when it's time to sleep and when it's time to wake up by using light and sound cues. It even coaches you through meditations and mindfulness exercises that turn the time before and after sleep into restful little rituals. Your Hatch will um, help you sleep deeply by playing white, pink, or brown noise and other sleep sounds inspired by nature. Nature. Plus, I hate jolting away to a harsh alarm clock. That is just not a good feeling. And the Hatch Restore 2 wakes you up gently with a sunrise alarm that supports your body's natural rhythm. You can't force yourself to get into a great sleep, but you can learn it. And that's why I love Hatch Restore 2 so much. Personally, we have been using a Hatch for probably over a year now and really love it. And the sunrise effect really is cool. I didn't know if I would really like that or if my body would wake up to that, but it does make your body wake up so naturally and Chris and I both love listening to pink noise so we turn that on every single night our kids like that now too and um, we just love a good hatch it helps us go to sleep stay asleep and wake up great so right now hatch is offering our listeners $20 off your purchase of a hatch restore too and free shipping at hatch.co slash whoa uh, sleep deeply and wake up gently with restore to go to hatch.co slash whoa to get $20 off and free shipping that's hatch.co slash woe. That's so good. I love that because people are so different. Like Christian and I are so different. Yeah. And it is important. Like we've learned to communicate the way that we want to be treated because I wouldn't even think about those things for Christian because he's so different than me and he wouldn't think about those things for me because yeah. I'm so different than him. But that communication is so key because then you're like, oh, well, I can do that. Like, yeah. I can treat you like that. Yeah. And as then you, you learn see, those yes, things, you about have to learn those things. Person, 
then you can be better at treating them the way they would rather be treated. It's good. Not the way you, you want to be treated. Yeah. Two mamas still hoping I'd get around to doing <laughs> that. <for you. laughs> 52 years in, hey, it's okay. Y'all still got yeah. more time. Y'all are That's looking right. good. Y'all are looking good. On. Okay, so let's get into some of your stories, you Balba. So um, I mentioned you've been a part of some big things that, you know, I think most people might be shocked to hear some of the things that you've been a part of. One thing that I think is so cool about your dad and and uh, people won't know um, Alton Howard and all the things that he's done for especially this town, but even the world. Tell a little bit about your dad as a businessman and entrepreneur and some of the things that you just got to see growing up um, that your dad did. Cool. Okay. So when he got out of World War II, he came home, uh, didn't have a job, didn't know what to do. His older brother, he had come home before my dad did, and he found a job at a shoe store in Mobile, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So he tells my dad, come down, I can get you a job. And so he goes down there and he gets one and they end up becoming the managers of two different Tom McCann stores in Mobile. And of course they learned a lot about business there. And so that was a really good stepping stone for them. They came back home because their older brother, V.E., said, y'all need to open a jewelry store in Monroe. Mm -hmm. Now we come to find out, he said, I'll give you all a lot of my merchandise, just give it to you. And what would, they didn't realize is it was all his over stuff and junk that they couldn't sell. <laughs> so they had a sort sure. full of stuff, you know, like that. And then, of course, they bought other stuff, too. So it was an interesting beginning of their business. But it was very successful. So that, that was their first joint into business together as partners. Early 1950s, a guy by the name of H.R. Gibson opened up a novelty gift and health and beauty aids wholesale business in West Texas. Well, this town he was in was too, didn't have enough retailers to really sell enough merchandise to them to stay in business. He's going to go busted. So he said, what am I going to do? And he put up a sign on the side of the building that said, wholesale to everyone. Mm. And he let the public in. And, of course, it went crazy because, you know, the public was used to paying retail at every place else in town. And here they go in here and get it for half price or whatever. So he just went crazy and it went crazy and he started opening others. And so the E saw that, that brother that lived in Texas. And so he and the two brothers here went out to visit with Mr. Gibson's and said, we would like to do this in our communities. Won't you, why don't you start franchises and franchises? Let us be your first franchisees. And so they worked out a deal. And ultimately, Mr. Gibson had over 700 franchises around the country. Wow. So but your dad's was the first. But my yeah. dad and, and the brother. So they opened the first one in Greenville, Texas. My dad and uncle opened the first one here in West Monroe. Uh, the same year in 1959. Mm. Um, and so, in fact, initially on the side of our buildings, we put up that thing that said wholesale to everyone because no one would know what it is. It's just yeah. another general store or yeah. whatever it is. And so uh, that told people the kind of prizes we were going to have. So anyway, it was a, a, a great start. In 1962, other entrepreneurs saw this thing phenomenon in Texas and Louisiana and everything and uh, decided to copy it. And so Kmart, Walmart, and Target, all three opened their first discount store in 1962, three years after we did. Wow. So that was the beginning of the discount store industry. That's crazy. That's so cool. Okay, so you grew up seeing that, seeing your dad do that. Mm -hmm. um, your dad also did a lot of things in the church too, which is really cool. And that's a whole nother story. Um, but just entrepreneur and a heart that loved the Lord and wanted to make a, a big difference in the world. So then you go to college. We're fast forwarding a lot here, but you sure. go to college and you come back home and you start taking over the business with your dad, start working with him? Mm -hmm. we, we had, by then we hit in, in, actually in 1969, we went public and dropped the Gibson's franchise and the Gibson's name. We became Howard Brothers Discount Stores, mm. Inc. And so went public, raised a lot of money, started opening a lot more stores. I got there in 73. I took over budgeting and uh, created an open to buy system and wrote a employee handbook for the employees and everything. Which is all amazing to me when I think back. It's of, crazy. It was just 22. Yeah. And he goes to work as vice president of this major company that at that point had, how many stores did y'all have? At that point, we must have had about... Uh, 
60? 40, 40, 40 or 50. At that point. Yeah. Okay. And 40. tell us, because you were you know. working on all these spreadsheets, and didn't you say, like, you didn't have a computer? Yeah, the computer we had was this big monster thing. It was as big as this room. Oh the biggest this room. Gosh. And all it did was just take care of the accounting. It wow. did, you couldn't program it to do all the right. stuff that, yeah. like I was doing. So I had this spreadsheet, the columns, 60 columns that you folded out to. Wow. And I had to write the store number and the store name at the top, and then all the calculations, whether it was a budget or whether it was the open to buy calculation. And you're doing all that on I'm a calculator. I always do that on a calculator and a pencil. For, for years, <laughs> wow. if, I, if I asked him any town, he could tell me the store number it was, like, 33, you know. Wow. 47. Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Yeah, see, he, That's he would remember crazy. them because he had to do all this accounting by hand. Wow. And another thing that's fascinating to me, Sadie, when when we were young married, I used to tell him I've never seen somebody work a calculator that fast. But wow. that's what he had to do so much. It that's was like crazy. his hands were like super. <laughs> well, you said the other day you like burnt out so many calculators. Yes. And I was like. I didn't even know they could burn out. I've never gotten that far. <laughs> yeah. I've never they, used they were, it that they many were paper. Times. That was back in the old days. And the paper came out. You know, you put oh. the paper in. See? Yeah, I was but like, I'm talking about what? The, the whole thing the whole, just stop. Yeah. So you get another one. It wasn't electronic. That's yeah. crazy. So. Oh my gosh. Okay, so you're doing all this. You have all these stores, and then what? What happens? And so in 1978, we sold the company with 78 stores to Gamble Scogmo. Uh, stayed on and helped them for a couple of years. Actually grew it from 78 to 110 stores. Wow. They gave us lots of money to expand. And so it opened some more store. But then just two years later, they decided they want to be in that business. Wow. So they sold it to the Wix company. And then we started operating it. Uh, by then, we had all left. Uh, and uh, that didn't work out well for them, sadly, or for us. Because uh, we were sad to see those stores close, but they went file bankruptcy and closed all the stores, and so I had to scramble. We had to get all those stores rented or sold very quickly so that we could pay our mortgages, and so I spent the really till today, but uh, uh, exclusively for a couple of years. That's all I did. I sold them to or rented them to Kmart, Walmart, Brookshire's, Super One. Uh, other retailers around, so we f found a place for all of them uh, in a in a fairly short period of time. Back before cell phones, every time we went on vacation or anywhere, we stopped at nearly every payphone. Wow! We had to have a pocket full of quarters. Wow! Because he was always calling and checking on a property or wow. checking on something, and almost every town we went to, yeah, it was one to look at because we had and sometimes every day of them. during the. Uh, vacation at the condo. Yeah, I had to go into town to find the payphone. Wow! And uh, uh, yes, call okay. And see so what's I want to ask you because we're in a generation where what I'm seeing from a generation is, and we even saw this last night on Survivor. So yes, if you watch Survivor, we just we've watched faithfully <laughs> since I was three years old. And this new cast, it's kind of sad because it kind of feels like it's showing us a glimpse of what our generation's looking like, and it's like. People just don't like to work hard. They uh, tend to be more soft. They don't want to work hard. They're like scared of burnout. They 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 don't really want to work. You only work to have a paycheck, but then like you do your other things on the side, and it just feels like we don't want to work hard. But you worked super hard, and not only did you work hard, but it seems like as a generation, y'all worked hard. Everybody not did. to mention your parents, like your dad, who you just said mm -hmm. once he got home from the war, then he started working at a shoe sh uh, shoe shop. Then he started to become to learn how. To be an entrepreneur then he went texting and you know, all that stuff it just seems like that was such a value back then mm -hmm. and now it's like such a oh I gotta work you know mm -hmm. and then oh it's too hard and all this stuff mm -hmm. but like what have you seen just like the benefits and the value of working beyond just like getting a paycheck do you think working hard had actually like made you have a better life <laughs> 
I am all about staying hydrated, especially as a nursing mom, it is hard to stay hydrated. You just cannot keep up. And that is why I am such a big fan of daily electrolytes. And that is why Element is actually my favorite because it has everything I need and it tastes so good. It can make such a big difference in your life when you have your daily electrolytes that are balanced with full hydration. And luckily, Element is here to help you with that. It's a tasty electrolyte drink mix with all the things that you need and nothing you don't. That means a lot of salt, but no sugar, no coloring, artificial ingredients, gluten or fillers, basically no junk, just a science-backed electrolyte ratio of 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. And I love that Element is out here giving us everything our body needs, and I truly do feel the difference whenever I drink it. Electrolytes facilitate so many functions in the body, including hormone regulations, nutrients, absorption, fluid balance, and conducting nerve impulses. When we sweat, we lose our electrolytes mostly in the form of sodium. And if we don't get it back, we can experience headache, muscle cramps, fatigue, sleeplessness, and so much more. I get the worst leg cramps whenever I don't have enough electrolytes. Electrolytes are so important and Element can help prevent all of these symptoms by keeping your body in balance and it can work for anyone because it works with keto, low carb, or paleo diets. Like I said, I get the worst leg cramps whenever I do not drink my Element, whenever I don't have my electrolytes in me. I actually thought I was going into labor one day whenever I was pregnant with Haven and I called my doctor and he was like, I think you just need some potassium and some electrolytes. Go drink something like an Element. And so got my Element and y'all, let me tell you something, all those contractions went away. Sometimes you just need electrolytes and I love it. Raspberry is actually my favorite flavor that they have. I like the watermelon too. But today I'm drinking my citrus salt, which I also really enjoy. I've tried all of them. I like them all and I literally do drink them every single day. Um, Element is used by everyone from podcast hosts to professional and Olympic athletes to everyday people who just want to feel better and be healthy. Right now, Element is offering a free sample pack with any purchase and that's actually what Christian and I got to decide what our favorite flavors were. So it's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. It's a great way to try all eight flavors and figure out which one you like the most and share it with your friends. So get started with drink element.com slash whoa this deal is only available through my link you must go to drink element that's d-r-i-n-k drink element is spelled l-m-n-t dot com slash whoa element offers no questions asked refunds as well so try it totally risk-free and if you don't like it share it with a salty friend and they'll give you your money back no questions asked on a hot day after you go on a walk there is nothing that tastes better than an element you have nothing to lose friends go check it out today Yes, and I think the why it is is because you have to look at all that stuff that you're doing, working hard, it's for others. It's that you're doing it to help others uh, have good jobs. I remember that we had 3,000 empl- 3,500 employees when we wow. sold yeah. wow. our brother discount stores. And I remembered in one sense the sigh of relief because I worried about those 3,500 people every night. Yeah. Uh, that we were doing the right things for them so that they could have yeah. good jobs and earn more and that kind of thing. And so if you understand I'm doing this for others, not for myself, then you're going to do the right thing. You're going to work hard mm-hmm. because those people deserve it. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. And you know what's sad is I think maybe the reason why we don't work as hard is because we also are a generation that looks out for ourselves. It's like we want we want to succeed. We want to reach the top. We want to have the most followers. We want to have the success. And it's like that's not how you should look at working. Maybe that's why it's so exhausting because it's all for you. And But if you view it for others and you're giving to others, maybe it's even for your family, for your community, for your people, then you're like, oh, I can do this because I want them to have a better life. And I think that you have to remember that everything pendulum swing, you know, mm-hmm. in life. Yeah. And we did go through a time where we were very work oriented. It seemed like society to young people are looking back at our generation saying, oh, they were just so work oriented. But I think you do have to answer the question why. For one thing, I think God designed us to work. Yeah. And w- that's what we're here for is to carry on jobs and then like johnny was pointing out when you realize that you're who you're working for you're working for the lord yeah and so that you can do more things with the the money that you gain from that you're able to do the good things that maybe we'll get a chance to talk about later on but you know you have to um i think you just have to realize it, it was a different time yeah but at the same time 
maybe some of the things that some young people are experiencing today, they would be would benefit from just going out and doing just something working. and working yeah. a little bit harder and, so and the true. self-satisfaction that comes with that and that's you know, so the growth true. and all those things, maturity. That's good. You know. I love that. That's so good. That's so needed. So you all did that. You have so many, there's so many parts of the story and we could spend forever on each part of the story. But then fast forward to when y'all open up a publishing company. So this, from my understanding, came out of because Pepple Howard wanted to write, he started writing songs like hymns and then he was like, where do I put my my hymns? And and, no new, and he decided. Oh, don't you, no new hymn all coming out, so he had no place to pitch his songs to. So he said, "Well, I'll just do my own." So he decides to write yeah. his own. And and back in that those days, there was co- no computer, no CCLI that where you can look at and you can see the best songs, to, the uh, top one hundred songs in America sung in churches today, and you could compile a hymnal with the best songs. Well, back then he had to write churches all over the country and say, "Give me your top ten songs." Or, the songs you're singing. So in fact, we have a trunk full of hymnals that he pulled wow. from that he that's to so create cool. the hymnal that he created. Wow. Because you couldn't Google anything. Yeah. It's everything is more tedious work wow. to accomplish anything. So, that is crazy. Yeah. So he published the first one in 1971. And of course, it was he was going crazy with the discount stores and the jewelry store and everything. So it was just a hobby. You know, he just... Uh, we don't know how churches found out about them. I mean, the word of mouth, you know, there was yeah. no advertising or way to contact right. them or anything. Wow. So the no word, social networking. The word got wow. out. And so right out of his garage and his kitchen, we were shipping books. Uh, Chris, we, we, we were building a house at part of that time. And so she was living at the house. And so she was taking books to the uh, post office. This is how we shipped them in those days uh, with my dad's station wagon. Wow. And my sisters did that too. With uh, the kids. With yeah. no car crazy. seats. Oh yeah, my those gosh. days. In the old days. And so uh, that just rocked along all these years as yeah. just a hymnal mm-hmm. publisher. Uh, when we sold Super Saver, I was said, okay, what's my next thing? Uh, and I said, I think I can take the publishing company and turn it into just a full spectrum publishing company, not just him books, but yeah. books, Christian living books and everything. So in 1990, I took over Howard Publishing as president and hired our best friends from college and said, let's do this. Who thing. had no publishing experience. Well, None of us did. None. And so it was I all on the it. job training. And, uh, and we were going to go after the biggest authors, you know, in Christendom. And we learned that we had to have a history of selling books before they're going to come with us. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so, uh, we were brainstorming one day about what we could do. What else we could do. How, what else we could yeah. do to, to sell more books. And, you know, we by then we maybe had a dozen authors and uh, some success, but not bestseller success. And so uh, somebody was talking about one of our authors had a book of stories. And those stories were just so sweet. And somebody said, you know, his stories are like a warm hug. And somebody said, that's it. Let's put together some books with some of his stories in a little gift book. Mm -hmm. And it'll be different. Most gift books back then was just a scripture and a picture. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were a quote. A quote. Quote, Quotes were gift books. Yeah. Yeah. And so this had a two or three page story and a quote. And a quote. And and a a scripture. And a scripture. And so that made ours more uh, interesting and palatable to the public. And so... We put those out, and they went crazy. Uh, in 1993 is when the first one came out. Uh, in just a few years, we had 30 different titles. Started out Hugs for Mom, Hugs for Dad, Hugs for Friends, that kind of thing. In fact, your parents did Hugs for Dogs. Pet really? Lovers. Pet, lovers, pet Lovers, Hugs for Pet I was lovers. in the pictures of yeah, some of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, you're on the cover of Hugs for Grandma. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and if you follow Two Mom on Instagram, you see her Monday Hug. So this is this is oh, what she used to do with these hug books. So yeah. Monday Hug is a continuation now of what was so successful back then. And tell how many copies y'all sold. So uh, in no time, but, and the difference was, we weren't now no longer just in Christian bookstores because these weren't the uh, the uh, hallmarks mm-hmm. of the world. Uh, 
there was at that time like 8,500 Christian bookstores. Mm -hmm. There were 65,000 general market gift stores. Yeah. So all of a sudden we have a lot bigger market. And the Barnes and Nobles and those kind of people wanted to carry them. Yeah. So we just opened up. And so we sold 11 million copies of Hugs Book million. during that So time. let me just put this into perspective for y'all. If you follow me on Instagram, I have a pretty large following. I've been putting up books for a little while now. And a lot of you guys have bought my books, which is, bought my books, which is such a blessing. And it's huge. So Live is probably my biggest book. I have like a plaque from the book company that sent it to me, uh, sent me a plot because I reached 250,000 book sales, which is huge. And I was so excited about it. And they celebrated that for me. But just for reference, 250,000 books is huge enough that my publishing company would send me a plaque and they sold 11 million copies of these hug books. So this was not just like a small thing. Y'all were running a publishing company with no publishing experience from Western or Louisiana and there's 11 million copies being sold of the gift book that y'all started, which then made the public go, who is Howard Publishing? Right. And so right. then y'all started getting big authors. So some of the, some of the authors y'all worked with, I mean, y'all worked with... Um, Oh, Max Licato, Max Licato, Rick Warren, Rick Warren, just like uh, the Zig big Ziglar, yeah, the Ireland, so big people, Lisa Welchel. Yeah. This is crazy, and lots of music industry people. Yes, because of our ability to get into the gift store market, that lent an opening for music musicians to use their words in yeah. a gift book. Wow. So we, we call did it the artist point, devotional series, wow. Point of Grace for him. A lot of the older ones. Wow. So that opened Christian up artists. a big so, door even for for me like so many people that i meet are like oh i know your grandparents because i worked with them so like lisa harper yes. when she was on my podcast she was like yep. i love your grandparents before <laughs> anyone knew who i was they helped me with my books and stuff like that so like it's cool for me because in the world that i'm in now so many people know y'all from howard publishing and when we started writing books i want stuck dynasty happened which we're going to get to that in just a second that's next because two papa had a big part to play and even us being in the warehouse where i'm filming this podcast right now um y'all helped us write our books y'all helped us edit our books because you edited for so many years you know so much about the book industry and so the wisdom that y'all had to help us with what we've done is just huge i mean even christian's like working on devotional right now and he was like i'm gonna send my edits to two mama and like let her edit it so it's just really crazy because no one knows that you know like that y'all did all that kind of stuff Y'all, if you own a small business, you know that when the holidays come around, it's very exciting, but it can get very overwhelming really fast. And that's why Stamps.com is here to help your business meet that holiday rush head on. Who wants to stand in line at a long line at a post office during the holidays? Not me. And with Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a scale for free. So you've got everything you need to get started saving time and money right off the bat. My LO team loves the Stamps.com mobile app where you can do everything from scheduling packages pickups to taking care of orders all the things right on your phone so shout out to my team lo they're literally the best plus if your business sells its products online like mine does stamps.com easily connects with every major online marketplace and shopping cart stamps.com saves my business time by letting us order um, shipping and mailing supplies from the supply store and automatically giving us the cheapest and fastest shipping options they offer huge carrier discounts like up to 84 percent off regular rates too so that's some serious saving people. Stamps.com has been the partner of over 1 million businesses for the last 25 years, including mine and my dad's company, Duck Commander. Our teams never have to wait in line or face holiday traffic running to the post office because we have all the access we need to USPS and UPS services right from our computer day and night. Doing business with Stamps.com is easy breezy fam. So get your business ready for the holiday rush. Get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code WHOA for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter the code WHOA. And we think it's just a God thing. I yes. mean, the whole journey. It Absolutely. is a God thing. The whole thing. journey is just a God thing. We think that God was preparing us when I left teaching school to join the publishing company, knowing nothing about the publishing company, I think God put me in training yes. to help y'all down the true. road. I mean, God was just like, wait, you don't know why you're here. Yeah. You really love teaching, but for some reason, I'm going to put you in this desk in this publishing company and with me going, I don't have a clue. What yeah. do I do today? My yeah. first day. And, and now I know he was just saying, you're in school. 
Yeah. We're, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm teaching you so okay. that down the road when Dark Dynasty happens, your family's going to need support. Miss Kay's going to need a cookbook written. Yeah, so Two Mama actually wrote Mama Kay's cookbook for her. Two Mama's not really a cook, but she's a writer. So she I'm took Mama <laughs> Kay's uh, recipes and made it into the book. And yes. so you've been a part of so many of the Duck and Dynasty the books, books. And pretty much all of them, you had a hand in it. But you even wrote some of them. And so, I mean, this is crazy. Like, no, I bet y'all didn't know that. And it's so shocking. But that just to say, I love what she's saying. Because some of you are in places in your life where you're like, why am I here? What is this job? This feels so random. This, I don't have any experience in here. I thought I was going to be teaching. I'm better at teaching, but somehow I'm in this desk publishing, editing books. But you just don't know what God is doing in your Absolutely. life, what tools yeah. he's putting in your toolbox that you're going to bust out later and be like, thank God I was sitting in that publishing seat, you know? And what seems insignificant in one season could actually be like the most significant skill set you have in another. Mm-hmm. That's right. And, and Chris started writing books too for us. And so during that which was a shock. Period of time like, that we wait, owned I don't know her how to write books. <laughs> we sold over a million copies of hers. Yeah. And back that to the hymnal, crazy. we sold three million hymnals. That is during that crazy. Time. So it I was mean, crazy. so much success in that. So then there comes a point where Simon and Schuster, which many of y'all probably heard of Simon and Schuster, if you know anything about the book world, it's a big publishing company, and they came to buy Howard Publishing, and so y'all sold it. Yeah, 2006, they came calling. They had been in the publishing business before and and just in the Christian, in the public, Christian publishing yeah. business before and just used one of their own editors to try to do it. And so they, they didn't really know the market and everything. So they closed that. And then they saw how big much how big the other New York City publishers Christian divisions were doing well. So they decided we got to get back into it. We're going to do it right then. We need to buy one of the publishers. And when they heard about us with the gift stores that they weren't in, they saw that as 65,000 more customers to sell to, even our own books, mm-hmm. other publishers' books within the uh, imprints within uh, Simon Schuster. So they came calling. Same thing happened. Made his offer we couldn't refuse. And so uh, we sold it to them. Chris and I, and the whole team stayed on for three years. Uh, they made me executive vice president of Simon & Schuster and the publisher of the Howard imprint for them. And so Crazy. I spent going back and forth between New York and West Monroe, uh, taking care of that business for those three years. Three years out, they decide that uh, Nashville is the Christian Mecca. Because uh, uh, several other they did Christian- quite buy West Monroe being it. <laughs> Dang it. They just didn't know. We've got Not it. Not yet. Here. We've Not got yet. it. Yeah. That uh, other Christian publishers had headquarters in Nashville. So they said, we're going to move your imprint to, hire, to Nashville. And I said, we're not going. <laughs> and so uh, that's when we retired. And uh, uh, that's awesome. That's crazy. And I remember when y'all retired because I was so happy because you were home more. And oh, yeah. we love being with Two Mama and y'all were working so much because y'all were running a publishing company that was hugely successful. And so that was all crazy. So all of this is before Doug Dynasty. Now, what's about to happen, I think, is really crazy. So one cool story is Two Papa actually is the one that bought DuckCommander.com and started a website because Pebble Phil, if you know anything about Pebble Phil, doesn't have a phone, doesn't have a computer, and didn't you tell him, like, you need to do this? And he's like, no. Yeah, well, I saw Amazon. You know, they started in 93 just selling books. And in 97, they added uh, music and it started going crazy. I said, Phil, it's 1997. You got to be on the Internet. You got to have your products out there. And he said, I don't know think about that. I'm not buying a computer. And I said, can I use the name duckcommander.com and buy products from you to uh, settle the public? And he said, sure, go ahead. Uh, there was another side to that, though. Uh, over those few years as he was growing his business, he was needing to buy more and more inventory and needed the money. And so... He, he asked us if we would loan him some money for a period of time. And so those loans began to grow because he was growing. You have more inventory you need. you got to borrow more money. And so, uh, man, how are we ever going to get paid back? Because it keeps growing, which is a good thing. Uh, and so but he didn't have a website. So, so you're I like, said, so, okay, I'm going to sell this, do this website, but here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to take the product from you, and but instead of paying you for the products, I'm going to pay your loan back. 
Hmm. And I mean, you're going to pay your loan back with the money I give you for yeah. the product. And so in no time, he's out of debt. Well, uh, he's making money off of us on documentary.com. And in 2010, we sold it to your parents <laughs> uh, for the just just the value of the inventory yes. that they were they were taken on and uh so could be their best purchase they've ever yeah that might be their best purchase they ever made so my dad my mom and dad decided to take over duck commander um and that was whenever i was younger and i remember like it I was guess somewhere around that same time. Probably close to middle school age for me. And they were running Duck Commander out of our garage. So, like, our garage was like all t shirts, duck calls. All, it's back to the early um, hire publishing yeah, days. The, all <laughs> yeah. of the things. Yes, it was like craziness. And then, um, you know, of course, my dad ended up getting us a show on Duck Commander. It was a Duck Commander family show on the Outdoor Channel. But this was before it was big or anything like that. This was when you're helping. Um, there, My parents are just taking over us out of our garage. It was pretty small, small business at the time. Well, then... It's crazy because this warehouse where the Duck Commander warehouse is, if you have watched Duck Dynasty, you've seen the warehouse, and many of you have even stopped by on your interstate stop to see the Duck Commander warehouse. You might have done the tour here. We record podcasts here. This is the Duck Commander warehouse. But before it was the Duck Commander warehouse, it was the Howard Publishing Books warehouse. So what year was it that you sold everything? Okay, we sold the company in 2006. Okay. In 2009... We still hadn't sold it. The, the empty sold building the, yeah. hadn't sold the, the empty, yeah. hadn't sold the empty building yet. And uh, Willie calls me one day and says, "Pop, the uh, there's a flood coming on the Washita River, and of course you know when that happens, it floods right up to Phil's house, and hit Phil's warehouse at the time was storage buildings in his front yard." So every time he'd need more room for inventory, he'd just buy another storage building. Which is still there. So the front, yeah, right. for his front yard has all these storage buildings around it. So, of course, Willie said, we're fixing to lose everything in the stock in these buildings because they're going to go into water. So could we borrow your warehouse for a few weeks, put our stuff in, kind of operate out of there until uh, the flood subsides, and then we'll bring it all back down here. Well, it's 2023, and they're still here. They never left. Yep. So that was so how. So that's and, how they got in the warehouse. Yeah. Now the happiest person in that whole deal was Miss Kay, because she had to cook for all her all those employees that worked down in her yard and in her house every lunch. So she had a, a whole bunch of hungry boys yep. at her table every single day of the week, yeah. and now she's like, oh. They're up there. They're up there. <laughs> and they can go yeah. to McDonald's if they want to eat. That's so true. So Willie moved it to the warehouse, which was way bigger than he needed because storing books is more than a little duck haul. But he was convinced that he was going to grow the company. And then, of course, what happened was. Yeah. Um, so 2012, 2012, Duck Dynasty started. So get this. 2009, the flood's coming. So my dad's like, can we move everything to this warehouse? Well, it seemed massively big for what they had at the time. Because it was 30, a relatively feet. small business for 30,000 square 5, feet. 000. They needed, yeah. They did not need the space. Well, then in 2012, when Duck Dynasty started, so just for reference, before then, in a typical year, they would sell about 80,000 duck calls. That would be pretty typical. The year Duck Dynasty started, they had to, um, I think they sold 1.2 million duck calls. So in one year, 80,000 duck calls to 1.2 million duck calls. And so then they absolutely needed a 30,000 square foot warehouse. And it was like scramble. It was crazy. I remember everybody being up here for Christmas, people who didn't work here, people who were just friends, family, just to get these orders out. And now this warehouse is not only, um, yes, it still has the Duck Commander stuff. There's even another building that has Duck Commander stuff. It's hosting podcasts. It's where um, my parents like have all the, like it's hosting so many different things. But at the time it just felt like, can we just move there while it floods? And so it was just crazy how God just provided and all the provision along the way for what we needed at the time when we needed it. And then too, Papa, because Corey and Willie were so busy, filming the show, he came to work for Duck Commander yeah. and stayed here until 2020. So, you know, again, God's just like the whole journey. Had an office here. And all everything. the way through, yeah. And yeah. So it really is crazy how much of your story has been a part of all of our story. And one of the things I learned when I was listening to you is I, I would not have thought I'm so much like you until I heard everything that you shared. And I go, 
that's where I get that from, <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, that's what I get from mom, but that's what she got from you, you right. know? And just seeing the legacy trickle down, it was just really, really cool. The, the heart for, even some of the things that you said, I mean, um, y'all, Howard Publishing won, you said five years in a row, the best Christian place to work and uh, cr- Christian like atmosphere environment to work in. And some of the things that you said, I was like recording because I was like, I want to do that at our office. And I was like, we do that at our office. Mm-hmm. And it's because I've seen y'all do that. I've seen my parents do that. I want to do that. And you've just created such an amazing legacy. And I think this is really cool too, because like I mentioned, a lot of people know my other grandparents and a lot of people, you know, know the Robertson family name, but without the Howard family, um, the Robertson family wouldn't be doing what the Robertson family is doing because of what, who y'all are and what y'all have done. And I think sometimes, you know, like I said, we're all looking out for ourselves. Sometimes in this generation, we want to be the name, we want to be the thing. But some of us, like, you might not be the cover photo, you know, you might not be the big name, but your role and who you are and you showing up to work is so important because if it didn't happen, the impact would not happen. Like today, Today, actually, as we're recording this podcast, the blind movie came out and it's a story of Phil and Kay's life. Um, but, you know, all of the things that Duck Dynasty happened, it might not even happen if Tupac had never said, Phil, you need a website. We need to get duckcommitter.com up there. And so your part has a huge part to play in the story of history. And just don't underlook your part because your name isn't known around the world. What if your impact is, you know? And your impact certainly is all around the world in so many cool spaces and unique spaces. Um, you said a quote that day when you shared the speech and I loved it. And it was um, in reference to kind of Pebble Howard when you talked about you plant trees so that others uh, can be in the Warren shade. Bucket, what was that? Warren Buffett said uh, someone planted a tree that someone else will be resting under the shade of many years down the road. Mm. I love that. But I love that you said we're not just supposed to sit under the shade, though, Mm -hmm. but we have to plant more trees so that our grandkids and the next generation can do that. And I just love that because I even think about the neighborhood that we all live in. And many of you know that that's a thing. We kind of all live in the same place. And that was started by my great grandpa, out in Howard. Mm -hmm. And he literally planted trees that we're literally sitting under the shade of. And I'm like, I am so grateful to sit under this legacy and to sit in this place. But at the same time, I'm not just going to sit because we have Honey and Haven coming up. We have their future kids coming up. What seeds can we plant for that generation, uh, you know, to, to get to enjoy? But then what are they going to plant, you know? And you said it earlier, like, we are meant to work. We're designed to work. Like, God put Adam in charge of the garden. He got to name the animals. He got to tend that place. And we get to do that with our spaces. And I just love seeing the beauty of, like, the generations. I, I love love that y'all, you know, didn't just move to Nashville, but you said there's something here special and it's family and it's things that we've created and started and we have more to do and we have more to give to this place. And y'all's life has just lived so selflessly. One of my favorite things about y'all is how many people have lived in your home. Um, Because two papa only counts if you've lived in his home, if you've lived there for over six weeks. So how many people have lived in your home for over six weeks? I think we just crossed 110. 110. (laughs) So what is the importance of not only working hard, but giving back in in your mind? Because one thing I have seen with y'all, you've never been selfish with your with the things that you've been given. And in fact, I know all the successful things in business. I've never heard you say a number. I made you say 11 million books because I just wanted them to know that's really crazy in reference to, you know, what my books sell, which is really amazing too, but that I just wanted them to know, but you never say numbers. You never brag about like, I know more of what y'all have done for others than what's been given to you. And so what is that importance of giving back? And what does that practically look like for y'all right now? Well, it's critically important. You know, uh, Chris and I have always uh, uh, been, you know, big givers and help a lot of uh, ministries and stuff around the world. And the impact that those ministries have on uh, the world is more than pays us back for whatever we invested in it. Uh, in fact, my father, he started, uh, in fact, this is its 60th anniversary this Sunday, mm. uh, One Kingdom. Uh, it started out as World Radio. Uh, 60 years ago that my dad started and it it preaches the gospel on radio stations and now on the internet around the world 
and they've got followers from 70 countries now. And that continues to be a big legacy. You don't think about that uh, until podcasts came along about, Mm -hmm. you know, how important even in third world countries the radio was Mm -hmm. uh, and now the Internet. And so that's had a big impact. Uh, And then uh, in 1980s, um, we started a relief ministry that's part of that same ministry. And uh, we've raised over $80 million for those and, and that's all about relief work, people in uh, disasters, taking care of them all around the world, and of course in the states too. Wherever the disaster, we're there. We try to be first on the thing, and we want to be the last to leave. That's awesome. We do it all through churches. We don't do anything direct f- from us to the hand. It's all a church that they're going to to get the money mm-hmm. or get the f- supplies or whatever we're providing them, so that the church becomes known in that community as givers and helpers so that those churches can grow and not just feed their bodies, but feed their souls. That's amazing. And not to mention Camp Chioka, which Pebble Howard um, bought the land for, and you all have continued all these years. And Tumama, how many years have you been at camp and worked at camp? Well, it started in 67. I've been there every year except the second year when my parents went on vacation that year because <laughs> back in those days camp was just that one week so mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't have any choices so i missed that second year but other than that i've been there every every year it's crazy so. and she's, now she's basically running it yeah she did every job she was a camper a counselor in charge of crafts lifeguard uh, lifeguard <laughs> and bible director, teacher bible it's teacher amazing. and director it's amazing. And this year, 70 years old, you're out there with two boots yeah. and you ran the entire thing yep. um, because did. y'all believe in medical the mission. Boots. You believe in the mission. Yes, medical boots, yes. not not cowgirl boots. <laughs> not boots. <laughs> but she, she, they just pour in because they believe in what they're doing. And, and just real quickly, do you even know how many businesses are the, that you did start? Um. I think it was probably about 30. Okay, so I love that he said this in a speech. He said, just in case you think everything I did turned to gold, it's not true. He started about 30 businesses and about five of those were very successful. And I love how you said it, the five of those made up in, so in abundance for the 30, the others, that, the 25 that didn't necessarily work out. But I love that he said that because, you know, you're going to have to just try things in life. You're just going to have to go for it sometimes. And some things is not going to work out, but that doesn't mean you are a failure. That doesn't mean you missed it. That doesn't mean you missed your call. And we put so much emphasis on like, you know, if we have one one fail, we're like, we are a failure. And then you just quit. Like, don't quit. Get back up. Learn from that. Start something different. Um, Elon Musk is the same way. You know, he started like all these different things and like four of them have been extremely successful in billion dollar businesses and nobody's talking about the other ones, you know? And so sometimes even along the journey of trying one thing, that's what leads you to the next thing, which leads you to the next. And in all of those things, you grow and you learn and it helps you, again, put more tools in your toolbox. And so we can learn so much from you. We can sit here forever and we could have talked about a million different things, but I hope that was so encouraging to y'all. I know you've learned a lot of life lessons in the midst of those things. Um, And just uh, one thing I just keep hearing what they're saying is, you know, wherever you are, like, sow into that place, water the ground there, let it, let it flourish, give it time to do so. I think we're so quick to move to the next thing, to the next place. And if everyone moves to LA and everyone moves to New York and everyone moves to Nashville, you know, that, that's cool, you know, but why don't we stay planted where we're at? Give it time to grow the roots. Give it time to see something water from the ground. Give it time for a harvest to grow. I just think, you know, we've seen such a blessing from generations planting seeds in one place. And we've seen such a harvest from that. And I just want to encourage you where you are at might seem insignificant. Where you are at, you might be looking at everyone else around the world. And it seems like they're getting success faster. But just because they're getting it faster doesn't mean it's as long lasting. Doesn't mean it has a, a, as much longevity, it has have as much fruit that can grow. And so trust the process, trust where God has you, trust your hands uh, to keep working. In uh, Ecclesiastes 11, six, it says, I'll c- continue to put your seed in the ground and water. I won't get idle with my hands in the evening. I'm just gonna keep putting my seed in the ground. I don't understand what God's doing. I'm gonna let him bring the rain and water. And one day I just believe that this is gonna turn to something special. So I hope that encourages you right where you are at. Amen. Um, and we love you guys. We hope you have a great rest of your week. And I hope that you learned so much from this awesome podcast.